I'm not okay. sure if you can. So did so so Michael just asked me who my inspirations were. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was so. <clears throat> So I was uh, inspired by a number of people. I think I was dragged kicking and screaming through this whole, you know, freedom movement, questioning history. Um, it was so slow and, you know, so brutal that it's hard to pick a starting point. I think the very first thing that just opened my eyes was a um, discussion between Bert Folsom, a historian, and Glenn Beck on the Glenn Beck show. And Folsom... Uh, was giving like great economic analysis of the New Deal, how it actually prolonged the Great Depression, creating the recession of 1937 within the Great Depression, all this stuff. The state, by not allowing people to trade voluntarily, siphoned off resources which would have otherwise met consumer demand and brought the economy back to relatively satisfactory employment. He He throws such a big wrench in this. And at the end of the conversation, he mentioned something like, yeah, and, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor is, you know, another one of those things that you uh, got to look into. And I just said, I can't believe that there was a kook who believes there was something more to Pearl Harbor. Because think of th think about the implications. If the official story of Pearl Harbor isn't true, we got a lot. So we have one of the great presidents, FDR, is not so great. We then have to acknowledge that secrets can be kept for very, very important topics for very, very extended periods of time. And then you have to say, and it's been verified and the mainstream media hasn't reported on it. So this was so big that I couldn't believe it. There's a number of pieces of evidence that are sort of suspicious. You know, why is FDR having the fleet in Hawaii? He allegedly pushed for it when it didn't make sense. There is a document called the McCullum Memo this was produced or made popular in a 1999 book, Day of Deceit, by Robert Stinnett. And the McCullen Memo set is written by General Arthur McCullum and says, here are eight ways we could get the Japanese to initiate an attack on America. We can do things like... Um, uh, c cut off Japanese assets and stop their exports. The important thing about these eight points is seven of the eight were actually implemented. So you might be able to say, all right, some kook in the military said, you know, had the idea. What? A, so that's one guy. What matters is they were actually implemented. The biggest being the Export Control Act of 1940. So we have an actual document exposing this. Mainstream media doesn't really care. None of my teachers really thought to mention it. Every time I bring it up, even though it's a primary source, they they could not be less less interested. Now, Funny what did Don way. Jr. Yeah. Now, what did Don Jr. say in the meeting with a guy who had been to Russia? Oh, well, that's top priority, obviously. It, it, constantly distracting you with nonsense. The implications of this were so big that it's like, okay, well, if this is a lie, what else is a lie? A uh, couple other things. There was actually a book written in 1947 by George Morgenstern. Not to be confused with George de Mornshield, totally different guy. George Morgenstern wrote a book called Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor, The Story of the Secret War. And in there, he quotes Henry Stimson's diary uh, that has been published by Yale. And in the diary, Stimson talks about a meeting they had in November of 1941 about what they could do to get Japan in a position to initiate a war. Now, it, this, again, is totally weird if you don't know anything. You're like, but they're there to protect us. And if they don't protect us, they'll look bad and they won't get reelected. So how is this happening? And then you're to introduced to the alternate reality reality of, well, whenever there is a terrible incident, this actually creates a justification for the very people in positions of influence to do something they otherwise would not have had the public opinion or the public support to do. Biggest example is George Bush having a 90% approval rating after 9-11. So government's there to keep you safe. They don't keep you safe. And then their budget increases. Well, anyone who studies economics will realize, well, now they have an incentive to not keep you safe. They have an incentive to let BLM and Antifa riot everywhere so they could say, see, without us, you know, think bad things would happen. So 
that was one of the biggest things. So it was the amount of evidence, uh, primary sources, and it was the fact that it was such a big story. I mean, if you, <coughs> excuse me, if you are constantly listening to, you know, what we're called theorists, we just have theories. See, we don't really have any evidence. We just look at something and we see it up in our head. Well, in this case, I had a primary document. In the case of Anthony Sutton, I have America's secret establishment, the actual documents from Charlotte Thompson Isabet that she stole and gave to him. And, and I'm a theorist. Another one that was really big for me was the Lusitania. So these are two world wars. These are big things. It's not, you know, me picking on something trivial. Um, I believe it's page, I did write this down, page 432 of the Intimate Papers of Colonel House. This was published by Yale University. So not alexjones.com. I'm citing Yale University. And there is a discussion between Sir Edward Gray and Colonel Edward House, who Woodrow Wilson called his second personality, um, that they talk about what might happen if the Germans sink an American civilian ship. And Gray and him are talking and they go, well, this obviously would bring the Americans into war. It would ignite indignation into a people that were much more isolationist. Isolationist is a slander mind control term they call people who are skeptical of states initiating violence against civilians. So yeah, isolationism was sort of big in the same way you're an isolationist if you don't want to run into your neighbor's house and starve his family with sanctions. Yeah, isolationism. So we have a discussion about the Lusitania ship specifically, and this is according to Yale. Now, is it possible this is all fake? Sure, but it was published in the 1920s, and you don't exactly have rigorous debate about it. There is a high chance that this conversation actually happened, and people really don't find it interesting. That's another big one, where they're not even curious to talk about it, as opposed to what they are curious about. Is, is is all this nonsense that, as I said earlier, you could watch for hours on end. Another big one for me. Um, Robert McNamara. I forget his position, uh, but this was under the Lyndon Johnson administration. They more or less faked an event referred to as the Gulf of Tonkin incident. And you can see McNamara talk about it in a movie called The Fog of War fog of war. Isn't that a nice title? It was foggy. You can't see clearly. So when we lie and commit atrocities, don't be getting mad at me. It's, it's foggy and it's vague and it's hard to hold anyone accountable. No, you're lying and you're not letting us opt out of funding it. So I, I, I think I can hold you accountable. They more or less said that there was an attack by the North Vietnamese. Now, th this, this never happened. Total, total fabrication. Lyndon Johnson mentions the attack in his speech to rally the American public opinion. And what's also left out is the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, what we now know as the CIA, was actually funding Ho Chi Minh. This is widely accepted. You could find it on the CIA's website. The name of the paper, I think, is the OSS Ho Chi Minh by Bob Bergen. I forget the whole title, but yeah, this is something that we're able to verify in the same way as John Perkins has brought to light that the CIA did have Saddam Hussein as an asset in the same way you can look at uh, the work of Anthony Sutton, how the U.S. was, uh, the governments and bankers were funding the Soviets while saying, watch out, there's an evil group that we have to build up to go against. We have the same thing with, <clears throat> this was called National Presidential Directive. I think it's 166. This is Ronald Reagan saying, what we're going to do is we're going to send arms and money to the ISI in Pakistan, and then we're going to ship it to Afghanistan to fund the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets. Again, we see this arming a group and that being the opposition they later justify a war against to build up the state even more. So when you have actual documents showing the funding of the Mujahideen from the Central Intelligence Agency, it's incredible that none of this is, there should be a hearing about this. I mean, I know there's hearings. What is more important than something like this? Turns out, 
If you look at WikiLeaks, there is an email from Jake Sullivan, one of Hillary Clinton's foreign policy advisors, and he says, make sure Hillary knows that we're on AQ's side in this one. What this is in reference to is the war in Syria, where the US CIA is taking Al-Qaeda's side to fight Assad. So even today, so you have still funding of the Mujahideen. You have Michael Scheuer on CNN, former CIA analyst saying, you know, in Libya, we're going against Gaddafi, you know, who's a jerk and terrible and evil, just as Saddam is, but we're actually taking the side of who we would call Al Qaeda in any other war. We have General Michael Flynn. This is where, you know, they had to take Flynn down. Flynn is on Al Jazeera. And he's talking about, yeah, you know, it was terrible. I don't know what we were thinking. Um, we sort of, you know, are creating this opening for ISIS to flourish if we take out Assad. And this apparently didn't catch the um, the eye of uh, the, the corporate press or anything. So, again, you still have this collusion between who they are fighting against. They build up an enemy so they could later justify a war against that enemy. Um other blatant lies. So uh, babies in incubators. Uh, Michael and I discussed this on my show. This is one of those that's just so unbelievable because once you realize that this is an acting job that a PR firm set up, a PR firm called Hill and Knowlton, you, you realize, oh my God, what, what am I not going to get lied about when you see this girl, you know, crying and talking about the babies in incubators? Could you imagine questioning that? at the time. It's like, oh my God, if you think, you know, some of the things that happen today, it's wrong to question. Imagine this, this is like one of the most evil things and you going, I'm going to have to look into that. Like, you got to be a psycho to call this poor girl a liar. Well, it turns out she was lying. She's the daughter of the US uh, Kuwaiti ambassador. And this was a justification to get the US to, um, you know, fight the Hitler of 1991, Saddam Hussein. Um, not now. Another interesting aspect to this is April Glaspie, who was uh, part of the U.S. Uh, State Department at the time, actually was having discussions with Saddam's uh, cohorts at the time. And he was saying, well, we have a shared oil field here and Kuwait is taking more than their agreed upon share. We're going to invade now. Whenever a country invades, I, it, it's usually for nefarious reasons. I, of course, am not defending the evil tyrant Saddam. But if we really do have justifications for these interventions, well, then you don't have to lie about it. So that is really important when analyzing what they're telling us the justification is for invading a country. And it's important to mention that Madeleine Albright, the uh, ambassador to the United Nations was uh, made it clear that it that if there were in fact 500,000 children uh, dead as the result of U.S. sanctions against Iraq, that that was a price that she felt was worth it. So this is the amount of harm they're willing to inflict on innocent people. You know, whenever trying to hold evil dictators accountable. I get that it's not easy just to take them out, but at the same time, holding civilians accountable for what dictators do, and they're already suffering under the dictator. I mean, the, the claim is, well, we're trying to motivate them to rise up. Okay, they don't even have a second amendment, so that's it's a really far shot for them to rise up or violently overthrow their government. Meanwhile, uh, you, Mr. Right-Winger, who would say something like this, even though I'm probably on the right myself, you're afraid of being called, you know, a racist because that could hurt you. Imagine taking shots at the dictator or trying to kill them. This is so difficult. And in response to all this, that they, they just say, well, we're trying to get them to overthrow Saddam. So this, of course, is just terrible uh, lies. And then they lied us into a second Iraq war. There was a great article, uh, What I Didn't Find in Africa, by Joe Wilson, where he just talks about, uh, you know, Bush uh, got up there and just made up the fact that there was yellow cake being sold to Iraq from Niger. Now, this is what caused the Valerie Plame affair where Richard Armitage and Dick Cheney released information exposing Valerie Plame, Joe Wilson's wife, as a CIA agent. But just think about that. A president in a State of a Union speech just, just made up intelligence and 
what is the likelihood that we were going to figure that out if we didn't get one whistleblower? Now, if we had a thousand whistleblowers, well, you know, he couldn't have gotten away with it. But he almost got away with this big lie. And of course, it asked, it brings to mind what else? Um, what else don't we know? Other things that motivated me to really start questioning reality. <laughs> this one, seeing footage of the Bohemian Grove that Alex Jones caught when he snuck in was just mind-blowing that there's a bunch of elites getting together in the Redwoods. Nixon says it's, you know, the most homosexual thing he's ever seen. And they dress up in these gowns and do this, you know, sacrifice to Moloch. I just couldn't believe that. I go, what is more important than that? Surely the media is going to, you know, cover this. Couldn't be uh, less interested. Uh, John DeCamp's book, The Franklin Cover-Up, of course, was just mind-blowing. Uh, excellent exposition. You have Smedley Butler and Dwight Eisenhower and Donald Trump talking about the military-industrial complex. So we have three major voices. And, uh, you know, Trump, November 20th, 2018, was the date where he was like, you know, we should censure the Saudis for what they did to Khashoggi, but they are spending $450 billion to our great defense contractors. It's like, okay, I what I don't like about Trump is different than what John Brennan and James Clapper don't like about Trump. This is what they don't like about him when he actually is such a hothead that he'll expose something like this. So we actually do have a military industrial complex. And the fact that that doesn't get much, <laughs> much news, I would uh, say is another reason you should be skeptical of official stories. Um, there was a guy who worked in the Obama administration, John P. Holdren. He wrote a book called Eco-Science with Paul Ehrlich, in which he talks about the constitutional justification for eugenics, forced vaccinations, and forced sterilization. Literally, it's in there. It's in his own words. Webster Tarpley has a great summary of this book, but you can actually find the quotes of this. So we have big actual scandals right in your face, actual quotes of these terrible things happening that didn't uh, that didn't get much uh, attention. A couple more things that just really stood out to me. Uh, Obama's cabinet being chosen by Citigroup. So again, this is a WikiLeaks email where Citigroup more or less chose Barack Obama's cabinet. And it's so weird because at the time, 2008, I'm supporting Obama. And you have Obama coming out railing against the banks, calling them, oh, this th they're the greedy people who have ruined our economy. But Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, excuse me, are actually funding him more so than McCain. And even in this last election, Wall Street is funding Biden more so than Trump, which is just shocking. It's like, well, doesn't he want to regulate them? Don't they want to be unregulated so they could have their way with us? It turns out there is something called a regulatory capture. And of course, Ayn Rand wardens about this and Atlas shrugged all the time how businessmen are so often uh, colluding with the state to crowd out competition, which hurts the consumer, hurts potential employees, and hurts other entrepreneurs because there's less innovation. So Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, two of Obama's biggest funders in 08, were supporting him because he would engage in regulatory measures that would stop credit unions and potential competitors from entering the market. And um, this, uh, the, this Citigroup email was one of the most interesting things because it was like not even, well, we got to wait a few years to see if we could manipulate Obama. It was like right away. They just knew what, uh, what they were dealing with. The biggest example of banks using the state to uh, co-opt what would otherwise be, you know, free market transactions is the Federal Reserve, which was this big regulation written to keep us safe from panics and recessions. Yeah, nice try. In 1910, it was actually written on J.P. Morgan's property on Jekyll Island, and it was written by the six biggest names in the banking industry. Now, I would have thought, well, surely it's going to be a deregulation bill so they could be free to exploit the masses. Just the opposite. They gave themselves a legal monopoly on currency, which is to be lended to the government. And whenever there's a war, they're going to lend out a lot more money. This then will have to be paid back with interest. Money from nothing, 
pay, paying interest on that money. This has to be one of the greatest scams ever. And they call it the Federal Reserve Act, as Eustace Mullins likes to say. Here's what you got to know about the Federal Reserve Act. It's not federal. It has no reserves. And it's not a system, but a criminal syndicate. All right, that's pretty much it. <laughs> and then that would be like his opening to the speech. Um, and then one one final thing that just uh, that just blew me away was the talk of, <clears throat> excuse me, was the talk of, uh, you know, is the government spraying chemicals? This is a very dumb way to address an issue. Is the government? So you, you almost think of is, you know, uh, my governor behind it? Is the guy at the DMV behind it? Well, this is not what's happening. So they intentionally dumb down the possibility of what you're discussing. In reality, when you look into it, there's actually an operation called Operation Ranch Hand, where in Vietnam, they're spraying Agent Orange, which is killing and causing terrible things to a population. And then the excuses begin. Get ready. They go, well, it would never happen. They'd never spray. Oh, okay. Well, they would, but only against the enemy. Okay. Well, maybe they'd hit civilians, but this is only in a war. And then you go, well, that's not true either. There's something called Operation Sea Spray, where the government's actually spraying chemicals in what's called the Cold War experiments, along with Operation Do, Operation Low Area Coverage. So in Georgia, North Carolina, San Francisco Bay, Canada, they're spraying chemicals to find out uh, how the population will react. And of course, it, this is my favorite cover story. We were only doing it to simulate what might happen if the Soviets did it to us. I, 10 out of 10 on the propaganda scale for that one, gentlemen. Well done. So uh, that is another, th those are more or less all the examples of how my idea of reality clashed with what the evidence actually showed. And uh, that's why I uh, wrote those down. Well, can I quickly ask you then, because that list of names, uh, most of our audience will know, but before we move on, let me just ask you then, have you heard of a couple of these names? Bill Binney? Yeah, the NSA whistleblower. Yeah. Uh, then what about John Stormer? That name I'm not familiar with. Yeah, he wrote more in the 50s and 60s. A lot of later work, you know, that we've come across is actually based on his original research, especially in Pearl Harbor, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, 